Welcome everyone. It's the Mike Tech Show, show number 890. Boy, we're closing in on 900, aren't we? Tonight, going to talk about literally everything I was doing last Friday and a QuickBook solution. It's an oldie but a goodie, always out there to remind everyone a strange outlook view problem that's common and you're going to have some great websites to back this up. Uh, what I did with a compromise system and then somebody wanted me to deep dive Microsoft BitLocker. So I spent some time with ChatGPT and doing some research and I put together a PDF download for tonight and I tested it this time because the last PDF I had a problem. The link didn't work and it took a listener to to let me know and then I was able to fix the problem but I already tested it so uh, that's up there and ready to download so that's the show but an interesting problem that occurred tonight as I was getting ready anybody who watches my video on YouTube and if you don't hey head over to youtube.com Michael Smith MTS and Check out the videos for the show and click subscribe while you're there. I would greatly appreciate that. Well, I always put the Mike Tech Show logo and screen uh, a wallpaper that Photo Ray developed way, uh, you know, a long time ago for me to put on the TV. Well, I use Chromecast, which is connected to the TV, and that's what's running right now. But it's not displaying the logo because I would cast it from Google Chrome. I would bring it up on my monitor within a Chrome tab and I would cast. Cast is gone. So I didn't have a lot, a lot of time to research this. I looked and it said, make sure you're up to date. Okay. Make sure the extension hasn't went into the overflow. It hasn't. Cast is literally gone from my browser. I need suggestions. So email me, MikeTechShow at gmail.com because I really want to create that. It was working Tuesday night because I did my Frank Sinatra show Tuesday night. And by the way, I played music for four hours on Tuesday night. And I had a picture of Sinatra up on the TV. So the cast was working Tuesday. It's now Thursday and it's no longer there. So something happened. And if you got any info, just it's one of those little annoying things I would really appreciate. So last Friday, and of course today, days that my son needed off. So last Friday, he had a wedding to go to, had to get ready and everything. I, I was one of his best friends. Yes. And I was non-stop. Just all kinds of issues. And I want to share three of them with you and then <clears throat> and then today which is a whole new set of material for today and I was just crushed all day and I like being busy you know it's nice to be busy because the day goes quick but you get tired so here's what's going on for the first problem I needed to install QuickBooks 2023 for a client. As a matter of fact, uh, my client that's in Fort Lauderdale and the their CPAs and they need to open a file that was sent by a client, a portable file that they need to restore and open up. QuickBooks 2022 couldn't open it because it was generated in 2023 and I had not installed that or rolled it out because nobody asked me. Well, the owner, when I emailed, she said, Oh, already put the download and the license information and sent me the folder that it's on the server. I was like, great. I'll take care of this. Installed the database manager. This is a real, this is a domain controller, a real server. I installed that and we ran into problems. I got 2023 going with 
the person that needed it. But when they tried to do multi-user, that means QuickBooks 2023, when I installed it on the server, not the whole program, just the database manager, it really didn't start. It was starting the other services, but not the 2023. And I did a repair uh, uh, from, you know, QuickBooks and, it, you know, it was installing more things. I figured, let me reboot the server. I get everybody off. I reboot the server. You know, the QuickBooks service won't start. And that was driving me crazy. And then I remembered, oh my, whenever the QuickBooks DB, whatever number, if it just starts and stops right away or won't start, it's the DNS server service that is in the way. So the first link for tonight is QuickBooks 2023 and the DNS server service. And I've talked about that. So I, it all of a sudden dawned on me because I, re, I remembered having this problem a long time ago. And it's only on a real server that's serving up DNS that this would occur. So you temporarily stop the DNS server service. Then you can start the QuickBooks database. Then go back and start the DNS server service. So one of the things now, and I did this with another client, and I'm going to have to do it now. You have to delay the start of the DNS server service. And you can script and you could, there's lots of great ideas in this thread that on Reddit that I am posting in the show notes because it'll give you ideas of how to, if you run into this problem a lot, you know, anytime the server starts, I now have to log in and what if I'm not around? What if I don't know? And all of a sudden they're going to, you know, if that service doesn't start, they're going to have trouble in multi-user mode. So that is the fix. And I just wanted to remind everybody that. So let's go back and extend the discussion with my client that had that RIA and we had to flip back to SureWeb and Exchange host it. Well, Friday, I had done a full export of the IMAP fold, the IMAP folders right at the very top. I did a full export, then went back to the profile with Exchange and attached the data file. Okay, everything's good. My client calls me up, Mike, there's nothing in there. As a matter of fact, even if you found something in one of the folders within this PST and you move it up to a folder on the hosted exchange, you can't see it. It's gone. So here's the fix. When an Outlook folder type after exporting an IMAP account, you, there is an article on exactly what to do. And it is one of one of my favorite, favorite exchange websites. And again, there's so much rattling around up here in my head. I didn't think about going to slipsticksystems.com. And that is something that you got to remember. You're dealing with Outlook. You're dealing with Exchange, whether it be Hosted or Exchange 365. This has to be your first check, and that's Slip Stick Systems. Incredible. This, you have to view the hidden messages. You change the view. You pick Compact and apply current view to other mail folders. And once the filter is applied, you are able to view. Why is this a regular? Why? Would Microsoft hide the contents of an IMAP account from a folder in a folder? I, I, I'm, I'm speechless. I'm finding so many things over the last few weeks that Microsoft builds in and does with Outlook that 
just boggles the mind. I, I, I am shocked. Anyway, it's like we're going to be learning stuff and fixing problems forever, which of course we will. So uh, there's so the the thing is, does Microsoft keeps us employed? But it's frustrating some of the things that we run into, and I got to share these solutions. And so I had to share this because that was a first for me. And some of you probably already, wow, Mike, we've done that before. Well, I want you to, and I'm going to share the screen right now, just quickly. When I go to slipstick.com, the front page is the most common things that is happening. How to block foreign spam. Automatically open new Outlook item when Windows boots. Save messages in new Outlook. Block external content in new Outlook. Create a rule to delete spam with no sender address. Open Outlook folders using PowerShell or VB script. It goes on and on and on. And you take a look at sync and share Outlook data. How to repair a PST. The top Outlook issues. The Windows Store Outlook app. The signature or stationary and fonts button doesn't work. Outlook's new account setup wizard. This is a just a treasure chest of great information. It is a great resource. This is a site you absolutely bookmark. So to finish up client stories, the next link is going to be for Rogue Killer. Do not forget Rogue Killer. I remoted into a system on Friday where it was compromised and Malwarebytes didn't pick it up. Now, Malwarebytes is pretty good and I, I use it. I still use Adware Cleaner. Rogue Killer sometimes just finds things that the other guys don't. And Rogue Killer again found, I didn't have time to deep dive everything it found. I just immediately quarantined it and the system became significantly faster and more responsive. So that was pretty, pretty cool. And I just needed to mention, hey, is it going to be another link to Rogue Killer anti-malware? Now the next link is a YouTube video. This is is a short video and we actually have a client that needed to rip. He has not embraced Spotify or audacity for playing radio stations or music. He has 65. He picks CDs and you know, it's funny. His musical taste is very close to, to mine. A lot of classic rock and alternative. It was pretty cool. So, he dropped off the 65 CDs and said, can you rip them? And I had to research what was the best USB stick to use in a cheap Cherokee. Cherokee. And the consensus was the SanDisk 64 gig USB stick because he had tried others and they didn't work. So we now are challenged with what is the best way to rip I have not ripped a CD in eons, eons. I have not. I, I, I just don't live in a disc world anymore. Matter of fact, most systems I sell do not have it. As a matter of fact, he bought a system from us and there are, there are no CD or DVD drive. Well, that's changing because I just ordered an external one that was delivered today uh, in Pennsylvania and my son is going to install it. It was taking too long to rip the CDs and it would have taken five hours and there was no way I can bill the client that. So he said, look, do as many as you can in an hour and let's test. So that's what I did. So what did I find? Check this out and you could just listen to it. It's how to use the classic Windows media player legacy in Windows 11 Hi, in this video we're going to show you how to uh, use the classic Windows Media Player in Windows 11. So it should be there by default, but if it's not and you can't find it, what you could do is type in Features in the search box here. And then go down to the uh, Media Features section here. 
and make sure this is checked and then click OK and then you should be good to go. And then all you need to do is search for Windows Media Player Legacy right there. And then you just go through your typical first time run where you just do the recommended or custom settings like that. And so now you have it open. Now, before he goes on, I'm going to interject here. One of the things I found was I tried to get CDEX. I remembered that DB power amp that I had purchased uh, different ways to convert any audio format to any audio format came with a ripper. The problem with that ripper, when we tested it, it would not download the artwork and all the info. And you got to have that. You have to have the artist and the track and the description. There were services that you had to pay for to get this. Windows Media Player was perfect. It downloaded it all quickly. Let me continue here. So to make... Uh... Windows use it by default, you just pick the uh, type of file you want to open. So let's say MP3 file. So if we run this normally, it's going to open the, uh, the newer media player. But if we right click on it, open with, you, and if you pick it from the list here, it's just going to do it one time. So you got to do choose another app, pick that, and then choose always. Now you can see the icon changes. Another great tip here. The, uh, that was style Windows media player. So once again, just make sure you have that enabled in the features here and then just uh, do a search for it to run it once or just pick the type of media file. You know, if you want to do a, a MP4 movie or MOV or whatever, just right click on it, open with, choose the classic Windows media player. Okay, but here's the thing. He doesn't go over ripping because it is automatic. When you put the CD in, it will read it. Not only read it, but it will download the artwork, do the tracks, and you can rip. And so what we did was set up a default directory. Very easy to go into settings and set the default directory. And then we set it to auto-eject when it's done and to automatically begin ripping when we put one in. We were able to knock out 16 CDs in an hour. And then... My son met with, he came over to pick up the CDs and, and drove his car. My son tested the USB stick. It worked perfectly. So now what we're scheduling next week, I ordered the external drive for him and he's going to, we're going to teach him how to do that. So I needed to look how to get Windows Media Player installed because my son's going to have to do that when he goes on site, most likely Monday. And when he does that, then he can teach him how to rip, get it all set up for him. And we've now taught the customer how to fish instead of fishing for him and charging just an exorbitant rate for that. It's just not worth it. You know, I couldn't do that. So now he's armed. But that was a first. It's been a long time since I've had to rip a CD. And if you were ever in that situation, hey, Windows Media Player is right there and is perfect for this. All right. I want to now dive into BitLocker. We had an email from a listener that I read and commented on. And now let me go over some more details. And this is like soup to nuts. Everything you want to know about Microsoft BitLocker, but we're afraid to ask. Its full disk encryption feature is included with the professional and enterprise editions of Windows operating systems. It is why, and they began that with Windows Vista. It is why I make it mandatory for the pro version of every operating system. Yes, I know the Windows 11 Home, it's not the full Microsoft BitLocker. So I want the pro version, and it's because we can do full disk encryption with Microsoft BitLocker. So here's a detailed explanation of Microsoft BitLocker encryption. You have volume encryption. BitLocker operates at the volume level, encrypting 
the entire volumes rather than individual files. It supports both operating system volumes where the OS is installed and data vol volumes. The encryption algorithm. BitLocker uses strong encryption algorithms to protect data. So you can, you know, the standard AES 256 bit key. Key protection. And this is what the big question is. BitLocker uses a combination of hardware and software-based protection mechanisms for encryption keys. You always hear the term TPM. That's Trusted Platform Module, which, by the way, is required for Windows 11. So that's one of the things where you got older legacy systems that can't run Windows 11. There's so many things. It's processor, the graphics card, but it's also the TPM. It's a hardware-based security feature that can be used to store the encryption key securely. BitLocker can be configured to use TPM only, TPM with a pin, or TPM with a USB key for authentication. Users can also opt for a password or a startup key stored on a USB flash drive for added security. One of the questions was, well, you could bypass the Windows password if you're not prompted with a BitLocker. Well, no, because once the operating system loads, you're done. And before that, if you try to boot, and trust me, this I have done, you have a BitLocker encrypted system. And if you put a boot CD in, Figuring, hey, I'm going to use that trick and I'm going to bypass it and get in. Guess what? You can't read the hard drive. If you boot before the full operating system has posted, you are not getting in because the drive is encrypted. So now if someone compromises the password, sure. Well, if someone compromises the BitLocker password, you got the same problem. Pre-boot authentication. BitLocker requires authentication before the operating system boots. This ensures that the decryption key is not exposed during the boot process. If TPM is used, it can verify the integrity of the system files and only release the encryption key if the system is deemed secure. And that's what TPM does. And that's why it's hardware built in. All new systems will have it. But it's why you go back and some of the legacy systems, they don't have TPM built in. Okay. Key components of this. BitLocker drive encryption, obviously. BitLocker to go. Don't forget about that. You can have a portable disk, portable hard drive, portable USB, and you can BitLocker it. You And that's called BitLocker to go. BitLocker Network Unlock. This feature allows BitLocker protected system to boot up without requiring a pin or password if it is connected to a specified trusted network. So if someone takes that system off that network and somewhere else, nope, you are not getting in. Remember, one of the most important things whenever you apply any encryption, I don't care whether it's BitLocker or whatever, you need to back up the recovery key. And luckily, Microsoft forces you to do that. Now, if you have a network, you can store it there. If you're using Azure, it can you can store it in the Microsoft Cloud. I'm old school. I want the BitLocker key stored on an external USB. And then once it's in the USB, now we can copy the key put it in a secured place. BitLocker management. BitLocker can be managed through the BitLocker drive encryption control panel, a group policy, or through PowerShell commands. Recovery key is generated during the initial encryption process that I just discussed. This key is crucial for recovering data in case the primary authentication method fails or if a user forgets their password. There has been updates, especially when it's an older system, where a Windows update 
has forced BitLocker to react like something's not right here. I want the BitLocker recovery key for you to get in. And so that's why we got to have it. One of the things I like doing, we have a PowerShell script that if we deploy and there's BitLocker, even though we have a copy secured of that key, Synchro will run the script and I add it custom fields for the BitLocker key and you can grab that we grab the key and put it in a protected field within synchro so it's how we can grab bitlocker keys maybe we're taking over a client that already has it and we don't have access to the keys they may not even know where they are we can we can grab them by running our script so that's something i really really like compatibility requirements now, TPM is not mandatory for BitLocker. As a matter of fact, older systems, you have to. There's a policy hack that you do to require, you can turn BitLocker on and you can ask for a password. So it enhances the security, but newer versions may require TPM 1.2 or TPM 2.0. Operating system support, BitLocker is available on Windows Vista and later versions. Hardware requirements. BitLocker may have specific hardware requirements and it's advisable to check compatibility before enabling encryption. I have not run into a problem with a system that I could not deploy BitLocker. As long as it has the pro version, it, even if there's no TPM, and on some older systems, you'd have to go into the BIOS to enable TPM. And then you were able to take advantage of that for BitLocker. Now, when you go to turn on BitLocker, if you don't have TPM activated or the hardware just is, does not support it, BitLocker will tell you that you, your hardware, you can't do it. And so that's when you have to do the group policy to put it'll ask for a password that you can put in or you can have that on a file that's external. I once supported a company that we took over the support and they already had a specific USB stick that had to be in the system or the system would not boot. Now there's pros and cons to this that I w want there to be no BitLocker password because if we're doing full support for unattended access, if the system reboots, we lose access unless there's someone there. So it depends on the client, depends on compliance, depends on whether we can keep the hardware encryption so the system can remain on or we can ask them to leave them on one particular weekend because we're doing maintenance. I want systems to be on because I want the antivirus to be updated. Most likely I have an online backup running that needs to run. I want Windows updates. I want to be able to remote in at any time that if the specific scope of work and services applies for us to do updates off hours and weekends. We have this for several clients, so we will remote in. I have other clients. We are not, they may be on a retainer with us or under contract, but we are in no way allowed unattended access. And so we can set that up. So we have the client call us or we call the client and say, we want to do some updates. We want to work on your system. And then they have to allow us to connect. So you got to be flexible and you got to be flexible with all of those scenarios. But I don't care what the compliance is. And even with no compliance, every laptop should absolutely have BitLocker on it because that can be stolen, lost, there are so many things. Marius mentioned it can be saved on the MS account. 
actually, Marius, I did mention that. Thank you. Uh, for Azure, you can save that, which actually helps you. So here's the conclusion. Microsoft BitLocker provides a robust and integrated solution for full disk encryption in the Windows environment. It combines strong encryption algorithms with various authentication methods to ensure the security of sensitive data on both fixed and removable storage devices. Power management and understanding of BitLocker's features are essential for effective deployment and maintenance of encrypted systems. I think that's a brilliant conclusion for all of this. This is a simple two-page PDF, which I have already staged on uh, my website, and I'm putting the link into the chat room right now for everybody who's live on the show, right? You know, listening to the show uh, and watching. Um, yeah, I figured let me put this together and just have the complete resource on BitLocker. If there's something important missing there, or even not important, if I'm missing something there, hey, I'll add to this. Email me, Mike Tech Show at gmail.com. So there'll be a show next Thursday, which is the 21st. That technically will be the Christmas show because the next show after that will be Saturday the 30th. And then, of course, New Year's Eve. If, you don't, if you're not doing anything, hey, hang out with me. And some of the listeners will be live uh, broadcasting on Twitch. I'll start at 10 p.m. on Sunday night, New Year's Eve. And... Lately, I've been doing it every year. I, I make it till 4 a.m. So I'll be on for six hours. We'll ring in the new year across the time zones. But for now, next Thursday, same time, same channel. I want to thank Fred. Generous donation. Thank you, sir. I greatly appreciate it. And don't forget Discord. I have not mentioned that in a bit. And we're going to use Discord on New Year's Eve. And Discord... Think of it as forums where there's a section for the Mike Tech Show, and it's free to sign up, but you can do video, chat, there's questions. It has been a while since I've been there. I uh, apologize for not maintaining and being in, in the Discord. I absolutely will be in there this week, uh, and I want to put some comments up there and getting ready for New Year's Eve. So if you don't know, Go to MikeTechShow.com. There is an invite link where you can click on every show in the show notes for Discord. Click on that, sign up. Then you got to make one post to prove you're not a robot. So just say, hey, um, you know, Mike from New Jersey, and I just wanted to say hi and join. We just want to know that you're not a robot. And guess what? Then you get elevated and you can see all of the different sections of the chat and the, the forums that is it everybody have a great week see you back here same time same channel bye bye